Good evening, and welcome to the JFK Junior Forum at the Institute of Politics. I am, my name is Landon Elks, and I'm a first year studying economics and government at the college, and I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located both on the park side and JFK Street side. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK Park. We'd like to thank our co-sponsor, the Institutional Anti-Racism and Accountability Project, for helping bring tonight's discussion together. Please take a moment now to silence your cell phones and join me in welcome Harvey, Harvard College undergrad, Anjali Krishnamurti. Good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at the Institute of Politics. My name is Anjali Krishnamurti. I'm a first year studying government at the college and I'm a member of the JFK Jr. Forum Committee. Tonight we are excited to host a discussion that will focus on racial justice in sports and explore questions such as in what ways have players succeeded in challenging the national status quo by refusing industry norms? How much power do players really have in advocating for a position meaning means risking everything? And what can be learned from sports about refusing everyday practices in American culture? Tonight's amazing panelists include Neka Ogumike, the 2016 WNBA MVP and WNBA champion, selected first overall to the Los Angeles Sparks in 2012 WNBA draft, and currently serves as president of the WNBA Players Association. Neka is also an eight-time WNBA star, five-time All-WNBA selection, five-time All-Defensive WNBA selection, and was the 2012 WNBA Rookie of the Year. Amber Goodwin is the founder of Community Justice and Community Justice Action Fund and Assistant District Attorney in Travis County, Texas. Amber has spent the last 23 years working for advocacy, grassroots, and electoral campaigns. Rob Parker is a sports journalist with a 38-year long career who currently co-hosts a nightly national show with Chris Broussard called The Odd Couple on Fox Sports Radio. He's an analyst for the MLB Network, founder and editor of MLBBro.com, and also is an analyst for The Challenge on KNBC Channel 4 in LA. Parker is an adjunct professor at USC and has been inducted to the National Association of Black Journalists Hall of Fame in 2023. This discussion will be moderated by Ken Miles, who is the inaugural executive director at the newly established Penn Center for Inclusive Innovation and Technology at the University of Pennsylvania. Join us in welcoming our guests. Excellent. Um, thank you so much for having us. Thank you to Harvard. Um, thank you to Khalil uh, and Erica. Um, I, I've known Khalil since my time in Harlem uh, through the Schomburg Library and uh, a past life, it feels. But excited about this panel this evening and you know what we're here to discuss and be candid about and uh, recognizing the time that everyone's taken to talk a little bit about the intersections of sports, justice, equity, and legacies of racism and what that means for progress, what that means for where we go from here. Um, and to start off this evening, wanted to just pose a question, you know, when you think about advocacy, um, what is your current thought and practice around what area you're advocating for, and what is the medium that you are choosing to do it through? And I'll open that up to the panel. I'll start. Um, that's a, a wonderful question. First of all, it's such an honor to be here, and um, most notably to talk about something like this. This is something that has evolved in my understanding as a black woman um, and something that I have actually kind of like grown through in my profession and what my profession demands and what it doesn't demand. And I'd have to say that for me, advocacy is all about walking the walk and talking the talk. 
Um, I mentioned this a lot when people asked me, just to kind of put it simply, you know, after 2020, um, I got a lot of requests to go on DEI panels. And the biggest question or the most consistent question was, what can we do to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion? All of these corporations and big businesses were asking me this. And my question was, are you doing it at home? Because if you're trying to do it at work and you're not doing it at home, it's not gonna be sustainable. And that's what the goal is for change, is, is for it to last. And so I try my best to advocate for myself at home, um, for my family, for my teammates, um, for the league that I'm a part of, for me as a black woman who has a business, who is a brand. And I try my best to impart that onto others in ways that reflect what is authentic and intentional for them. And the best way that I do that is through connection. And so um, something that I really love and very blessed about what I do is that I get to meet a lot of different people. You know, I'm in a position where I get to meet a lot of different people, whether they're a fan of the sport, um, whether they're a fan of the team, um, or I just bump into someone who's never even watched the WNBA. But connecting with people um, is the best way that I know how to advocate for myself and for others. For me, um trying to make change, and, and it is an honor to be here as well. Thank you so much for having me. And I've been in the media for a long time, nearly four decades, and um, a lot hasn't changed. Some things have changed, but not as much as needs to change. When I think about my own career, if you could believe this, I was the first black sports columnist at the Detroit Free Press. Now, Detroit's a city that's 83 percent black. I was the first black sports columnist for the newspaper. When they hired me in 1993, the newspaper was 161 years old. So I embraced that and I looked at how can I make a difference. We talk about advocacy. It's one thing to talk about it, but it's also something about making things happen. And that's what I've done my entire career as far as mentoring and bringing other people to the table. We talk about diversity. We, we need uh, all kinds of voices. So what I have done throughout these almost 40 years is, A, I just, in 2021, I established a website called MLBBro.com, where we uh, cover black and brown major league players. And my idea was not only to cover those players who maybe don't get as much run as the other players, but also to develop writers, podcasters, content creators who look like those players and who people can relate to. We went from a staff of 14 in 2021. I now have 80 people on the staff of color who are covering Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball has also partnered with us now in seeing what we're trying to accomplish there. And then the last thing, it, in Detroit, a place that I'm not from, I'm from New York originally, but I spent 20 years of my career. And in May, uh, May 16th, we are about to launch the first all black sports talk radio station in the country. And we're gonna do it in Detroit. And the whole premise of this is once again, if we start in Detroit and we can be successful with that station, we can be, develop a network 20 or 25 other black markets, that immediately will give an opportunity of maybe 100 other people, right, with diverse voices who now have an opportunity to talk sports where they haven't had it before. So I'm all about it, but you also have to put up and put in the work, and that's what I've tried to do uh, along with just talking about it. Mm. Um, well, I, well, first off, just very honored to be here. Um, my name is Amber Goodwin. I would say I've been an advocate my entire life. Um, I think I would say it's in my blood. My sisters and parents would say it's because I'm a middle child and I always had to advocate for things, either up or down, um, in, a, in a family full of sisters and girls. Um, but I, I grew up um, uh, in a small town in, in Texas, very racist town, just for anybody who knows about Midland, Texas, you probably would, would know that there's a lot of racial issues. Um, when, when I got there and I was going to school growing up in the 1980s, um, you know, my, the school that I, the high school that I was gonna go to and that I was gonna swim for, um, the, the high school flag was the Confederate flag. 
Um, this is the 1980s, this is not the wow. 1950s, this is not the 1960s. So it was a huge fight and I went to Robert E. Lee High School, which is still <laughs> wild to say. And it didn't change until 2020 when everybody cared about black people for like three months. And so mm -hmm. that's when we got it to change to from Robert E. Lee High School. And so I think I've always been an advocate, but I think growing up as a swimmer um, and being one of the only black swimmers in the country, um, growing up in the 90s and the early 2000s, um, I was a scholarship swimmer um, at uh, Florida State. And I still, to this day, I'm still one of the only black swimmers that a lot of different, uh, especially Division I or just division schools have had across the entire country. And so always had to advocate as a student athlete. And now, as an attorney, um, I'm still less than 2% of all attorneys, which is usually the first and last sign of advocacy, legal advocacy, or criminal justice advocacy in this country are attorneys. And there's less than 2% of the entire attorneys in the, the country are still to this day black women less than 5% are black people in this country, and it's even worse for Latinx people, for LGBTQ people, and so um, there's still these big, the, and the numbers are not getting better by the years that we go up and down, but you know, I, you know, I worked and advocated on so many different issues that I don't wanna say are softball issues, but I worked on issues like healthcare. I'm like, everybody wants healthcare, did things like that, worked for elected officials like Obama that like people loved, and then I was like, I'm gonna take on guns. And I live in Texas, oh, wow. and so that's what I work on now. And it is, um, I would say it is my life's work uh, to advocate on. I have very much uh, the unearned privilege of never being, I, I've never been shot myself. No one in my immediate family has been shot, but it is a public health crisis that deserves advocacy every single day. And so that's a lot of the work that I do as an attorney and then organizationally is just making sure that we really understand the intersections of such a tough issue that it's really hard for people to understand unless you've been directly impacted. And I don't want people to be directly impacted by gun violence. I want people to feel empowered um, and have this, the self-determination that I feel now about how I wanna show up as an advocate. I don't have to just show up when there's a mass shooting. I can show up whenever there's really good things that are happening in Boston that, or that are happening in Austin. And so um, a lot of the advocacy that I work on is just making sure that um, we're, we can show up as our true selves, but also have self-determination to figure out what advocacy actually looks like, because it's never gonna be cookie cutter, it's never gonna solve all the, the tough issues that we're working on um, in this country. Mm. When I hear showing up as your true selves, uh, NECA, I would you know, want to acknowledge the leadership role um, that you've played um, as three-time WNBPA president since 2016. Yes. And, you know, a lot of players, a lot of areas of, of issue, um, a lot of areas ripe for policy change. How have you kind of been able to lead in that effort? How have you uh, formed a sense of policy direction and shaped policies that have been transformative, particularly um, over the past few years when we've had incidents of uh, state-sanctioned violence and police shootings, uh, when we've had the need for calls for economic empowerment and pay equity? Um, how have you thought about, you know, what was the what was it like to shape the Black Lives uh, Matter agenda from a WMBPA perspective? What went into that? Um, I mean, I, I always like to say that um, our, I guess our movement was met by the world's moment, you know, as Amber was saying, you know, those three months that people all of a sudden cared. Um, it seemed as though that was the time that we had always been prepared for. Um, when I was elected in 2016, shortly after, uh, Philando Castile was murdered in his car. And players had had enough at that point, and they had decided, hey, we're gonna do a media blackout, and we're gonna make t-shirts. Um, it started with Mini in New York, and there was not a lot of positive reception from that, from in arena security of the local police, from fans, from our own league. And it was just one of those moments where the repercussions didn't really matter and it was all about what was most important to be communicated in that moment. You know, we, we have a platform of sports and um, you know, there's always that saying of shut up and dribble. And my response to that is I wish we, I really wish we could. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Amber wishes she wouldn't have to come in every day and talk about 
people getting killed mm -hmm. in a public health safety, safety crisis. And so what we can do is use our platform. And in that moment, we did. Response changed. Our current president at the time was instilling fines um, to which they were reversed because it just became a, uh, uh, um, a, a league-wide understanding that this was bigger than us and that we had a platform to amplify this. And uh, you know, we learned our lesson, I guess, as a league and its players when 2020 came. So you know, we're met with a pandemic in which women and people of color are highly disproportionately affected by this, um, not just by health decisions being made and those that are dying from the coronavirus, but also by those losing their jobs. Mm -hmm. And we represented every aspect of what was happening to the minorities that no one really cared about, along with Breonna Taylor getting shot mm -hmm. sleeping in her home. All of these things, all of these people that are being affected by this is what our league is comprised of. And so after 2016, my goal, at least, I wanted my, I wanted my legacy as a president to just be that of communication and education. And so um, in 2016, we were able to, to mobilize in a way that garnered a collective understanding amongst the players. And then in 2020, that's when we really decided to strategize. We had, a, we had a very unique situation faced in front of us where we weren't sure if we were gonna have a season in a league where people are just telling us to be grateful for us having a league in the first place, let alone us trying to negotiate our own equity. Um, we're, we're on the heels of a CBA where we were able to negotiate more compensation and salary, but not at all where we wanna land. And then, you know, one of the demands of the players was that if we're gonna have a season and if we're gonna get 100% of our pay, the only other demand is that we dedicate our season to the Say Her Name campaign. And through that, through creating our Jedi Committee, um, we were able to get league members and PA members to come together and create programming, create education um, in, a, in, in a season where everyone was at the same place at one time and it was really like the stars had almost aligned. So we were able to educate ourselves, organize and mobilize in ways that yielded us being able to collaborate with the African American um, forum and we were able to get people to understand the importance of filling out their census. We were able to get our players and their communities to understand the importance of voter registration and then ultimately voting, um, to which we felt as though we had to show the example of the importance of getting elected official, officials that represent who we are by figuring out how we could impact an owner at the time who was contradicting our very existence for the political advantage of her, re of her election. I won't say re-election because she was not elected in the first place. Mm -hmm. And since 2020, we've never said her name, but everyone knows who she is. And we decided, okay, what can we do to figure out how we can make a change? And we started doing our own research as you, as you would, as any, as any citizen would. Who are the candidates? What do they represent? And we discovered Raphael Warnock. And so we said, hey, if that's important to her, voting is also important to everyone. Let's demonstrate how important it is to elect people that represent our values as a community. And we were able to really change history in a way that we weren't anticipating. Um, but we did it together. And I would like to emphasize we did it as women together. And I think that that's very important because the idea that feminism is exclusive to women is wrong. Femin feminism is all about equity and equality. And it's all about anyone believing in that. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of different people who were advocates for us. We had a lot of allies, both in the feminism space and also in the racial space because there were a lot of moments in that bubble that was very heavy for us and we had to we had to have hard conversations amongst ourselves like hey um you know i had to tell sue i was like there's there's a lot that i'm dealing with i need you to handle this and we had a lot of different moments that demonstrated what we were advocating for and it just was because we allowed the space to listen to those who don't always have the platform amongst ourselves amongst our communities 
and use that as a way to educate ourselves about what we can do to move forward so that all boats rise. We weren't thinking from an individualistic perspective. And then of course, we sought out the experts in their fields for us to figure out how we could use our platforms to advocate and force change in a way that benefits the people that look like us and the people that we represent. And it's something that I'm very, very proud of, not for me individually, but I'm just really happy that people were paying attention. I think we were just in a moment where all eyes were on us and um, it's something that I'm not sure could ever, um, could ever really be forgotten in, in, in a politically and social politically historical context. Mm. Yeah, I just wanted to, players have the ultimate power in this country. Mm -hmm. They really do, and most of it is wasted. It's one of the most uh, toughest things to see as a reporter who's covered sports for almost 40 years, because we've seen the examples of how you can force change. Donald Sterling in 2014 is probably the greatest example, mm -hmm. okay? Donald Sterling was allowed to exist in the NBA as an owner. He had a long chronicled history of lawsuits where, in Los Angeles where he wouldn't rent to black people or Mexicans. It was well documented. It wasn't, and yet he was allowed to be an owner because, black, because people looked at him and said, well, he's got a team but has 12 black guys and he's paying them millions of dollars. So that was the justification of allowing him to do that. Mm -hmm. And then finally we got an audio tape where we heard it for ourselves and there was no denial of what he was saying. And players said, what? We'll stop the money. They threatened to not play the playoffs. And guess what happened? Donald Sterling was removed like that. That's the power of the players. They do have power. The reason that you get pushed back with shut up and dribble is because they know how powerful you really are. Mm -hmm. The NFL players, they have a terrible CBA, terrible health care, terrible pension. You know why? They won't stop the money. Mm -hmm. You want change in this country? Stop the money. Stop allowing people to make money off of people who look like us, mm -hmm. right, without being held accountable that they have to treat us a certain way. Mm -hmm. So if you know an organization doesn't hire minorities or whatever it may be, then as a free agent, you have to let them know, I will never go to Charlotte. I'm just throwing out of place, not. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're in Boston, and don't forget. Yeah. <laughs> OK, Boston, Jackie Robinson was what year? Mm -hmm. 19 what? 47. The first black player in Boston was what year? Anybody know? No, 1959, 12 years after Jackie Robinson. Okay, 12 years after Jackie Robinson. But my point is that there is power because the, the, the black athlete, male and female, in this country, that's why they're always saying, be quiet, don't say anything, because they know you have power. Mm -hmm. And until the players utilize it and stand up and, and, and not use the excuse of making, that's easy, it's to pay off money. Mm -hmm. well, you can't say anything, you're making $30 million a year, mm -hmm. right? We're treating you great, that's all that matters. Why would you, why would you say anything? You gotta say something if you know it's wrong. Mm -hmm. that's it. Amber, I wanted to ask you, you know, engaging with athletes in the ways that you are, mm -hmm. um, in what ways are, are the lived experiences of athletes um, kind of coming to the forefront around some of the advocacy areas that you focus on, particularly when it comes to gun violence. How has that shown up in your work? It's shown up incredibly, especially in the last couple of years. I also just want to take a moment to acknowledge NECA because you kind of glossed over your leadership and how incredible it was what you guys did. I think especially as black women, we are disregarded in this country and especially our leadership, people don't listen to us and so I know you had to give up probably, so it, maybe it wasn't financial, maybe it was, but like you had to give up a lot to take a stance and so I just wanna thank you for that because I know that it took a lot. So I'm gonna give a round of applause to you guys. Um, we need to be giving people their flowers when they're doing incredible work. Um, so I would say it, it's been a really tough issue because I think exactly to your point, 
the reason why there are so many guns in this country is because of money. Um, being in the business of gun violence um, is now codified into law. There's laws that preclude us from actually being able to go after the people who are manufacturing and getting all these guns to flow in and out of our communities. Um, there is no impunity for a lot of these gun manufacturers who are working on it from a local level, trying to change different laws. But it's been really incredible. I would say probably in the last four or five years, but in particular um, this last year, we've been able to work with a lot of the players associations, but with, um, in particular with the NFL um, Players Coalition, um, which was started by Anquan Bolden, which is so kind of crazy. Um, 26, tw almost 27 years ago, I started college. Um, and Anquan Bolden and I, uh, he was the cap or I was captain of the swim team and he was captain of the football team at Florida State. And so we met each other almost 27 years ago and at Florida State. Um, and um, now he started this NFL Players Coalition many, many years ago, working on a variety of different issues. And we're getting to work with them now on the issue of gun violence. And what's been the, the, the coolest part about this is they could just take photos, right, NECA? People could just ask you to take photos, show up at events, and it'd be super, I don't wanna say easy, because it takes time and time out of your day, um, but the real hard stuff is making these hard calls and, and speaking out whenever it's not popular. And so on the issue of gun violence, I will say it has been harder because there is so much money behind the scenes from a business perspective in sports. People love their guns. I will argue with anybody all night long about the Second Amendment and what it precludes and what it doesn't, but um, a lot of the issues that we in particular work on with um, NFL and also in some respects some NBA players and other leagues um, is on issues that are this public health approach that doesn't actually have any sort of impact on the Second Amendment. Um, and so we've been able to work, we were at the Super Bowl doing different events there, working actually in the community in Vegas, and we'll be doing it across the country. Um, but the I think the coolest part about um, is specifically working with Anquan and Malcolm and the folks at the NFL Players Coalition is that they were like, we want to do, we want to lobby. Um, we want to actually go to Congress, we want to go to our local elected officials, and we want to work on prevention, um, and not just on what may just be kind of the sexiest thing that's out there, which I don't know if there's anything sexy about gun violence, but like not whatever is not in the media, they want to actually be working on preventing gun violence before it starts. And so that's been really incredible to hear from players and from people that are doing this work, and also, I mean, this is what we used to call ourselves, but also from non-revenue generating sports like swimming, like we're able to work with a lot of people in swimming and, and other sports that maybe are not um, the sports that everybody watches all the time, but there's still athletes that are out there. This is an Olympic year, and so we'll be working with a lot of the um, folks that are uh, either going to the Olympics or, have, or, or former Olympians um, to make sure that they're using their platforms on, uh, on the issue of gun violence and how we're preventing it across the country. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about um, present, and there's also the future of sports, which involves uh, student athletes for a lot of uh, folks who have been student athletes on the stage. Um, you know, there's a huge power shift. There's, a, you know, the wild, wild west was what you referred to it earlier. Um, name, image, and likeness, and how that conversation on what is emerging for student athletes is, is changing the game in terms of where power exists and how that's shifting. And I wanted to get a perspective on some of the trends that you're, you're noticing and observing in that space, how that might be shifting a power dynamic, but also some of the considerations that are also emerging around restricting that, uh, that power and that opportunity. Um, for financial gain and benefit for uh, this next generation and current generation of, of student athlete? Sure, I mean, um, we were talking before we hopped up here about how NIL is the wild, wild west. And I was talking with the women's basketball staff about how disadvantaged, it, it seems open because all, you know, all bets are off, but you have schools like Harvard, I went to Stanford, you have schools like Stanford where they're disadvantaged because say for example, we don't take grad transfers. You know, the, the portal means nothing. And I think every day about kids that are in that portal and aren't, they're just at home. Mm -hmm. um, and it may be because of talent, it may be because of fit, um, and then, you know, those that are or aren't in, uh, in institutions, you know, the opportunities that are available to them are dependent on a lot of things they can't control. Um, and, you know, I think it's amazing. I think it's important that these athletes are being 
compensated for their name, image, and likeness. But, you know, there's, there's always going to be something systemic to something that's new. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, prior to NIL, I experienced a lot of that. A lot of the women in the WNBA still experience a lot of the, the disparity in opportunity. Um, albeit now, you know, as they're in college, there's a little bit more control. Uh, but ultimately, um, you know, I have the perspective of a woman athlete. And of course, you know, like you said, players have the control and they have the platform. But there's also a level of control that they don't have based on things that they can't that they can't change, you know, being a black athlete, being a black woman athlete. Yeah. I mean, the fact that there still hasn't been a black swimmer at your school is insane, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, and, and then also too, you know, if we were to put ourselves in the shoes of a lot of these young athletes, you know, who's to say that you would have as many NIL deals as someone who just appeases the crowd more, even if you were more talented. And so, um, you know, I see a lot of different changes happening. I think it's very early on to kind of really tell where it's going to go. But I do know that, um, you know, I'm probably going to shift it a little bit more towards like uh, gender equity. But um, I do know that in sports today, um, that a lot of these women depend on their endorsement deals. Yeah. Yeah. We. We, de we our endorsement deals are over 80% of what we make compared to what we make playing the sport that gets us the endorsement deal. Mm -hmm. um, the engagement is two times more than likely for a fan to pay attention to a woman athlete. Um, and when it comes to endorsements and brands, you know, we're talking to a lot of these businesses and uh, organizations that want to put their products on different players. Uh, and it, and it's, it's increasingly so that more people pay attention to brands on women athletes and um, a little bit under half of those people or half of the people that are paying attention to women's sports are going to, are going to serve as the purchasing power of the impact of these women. Mm -hmm. And it's still, the question is still, how do we follow women's sports? Like, what do we do? <laughs> and I always tell people the blueprint exists, yeah. obviously. You know, it existed first for white men, and then of course, um, you know, then black men, and even still, there's a lot of disparity in that. Um, but you know, when it comes to black and brown women, um, LGBTQ uh, members, and those who are trying to just play at a high level, the disparity is still very much, very much not where we want it to be. And um, the racial, the racial experiences of those athletes affects their livelihood. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do, I do have uh, a pushback. Sure. And my, my biggest issue, too, again, is in this sports forum is supply and demand. And women have not supported the WNBA and some of these sports enough to me. There are more women than men in this country. Mm -hmm. when, they, when the attendance is 6,000, that's the average of the WNBA. The powers that be that pay the money, the, the TV ratings numbers, and all those things are, are concrete. They are. Because when there are women who are playing and they're getting ratings and numbers, people pay attention. And I'm, I could probably ask the women in the room, have they been to a WNBA game? The league's been around for almost 30 years. I talk to people all the time, females. Have you ever taken your boyfriend on a date or your friend or whoever to a WNBA game? I ask, most of the women will tell me they've never been to one. Well, this is what I'm saying when you talk about the inequity of it, is that women have power to make what they do important. But you have to lead the way. If you're, if you're waiting for men to embrace the WNBA and fill the arena, it ain't going to happen. It, it's not. So my question to you is this, why do you think that is so? I have no idea why women won't support each other. I, I, I don't I mean, I, 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 might push back, I don't, sorry, I don't I understand it. Um, like, I don't. Men set up the system that probably is precluding women from being able to be I a part of all those, to those, <laughs> no. those systems. So. They, set up, they set up, they stop women from yeah, buying I mean, tickets? No, but no, there's, there's probably different reasons, the same systemic reasons 
that it, it, that precludes women from being a part of different parts of society are probably the no, same. No, but I'm just asking. I'm like just asking about buying games. tickets to the WMBA. Yeah, game. No, but is I, anybody I, stopping anybody from no, doing that? No, but I would also say, what's the problem with men buying those tickets? Mm. But there's you, nothing wrong with men, men but the no, no, there's no. nothing too. wrong with. It's not. I'm not. It's not an either or. No, no, no. Right. It's not an either or. Sure. But but I'm just saying. You, you can't, 28 years later into the league, you have 6,000 attendants, okay? And I'm just saying, if that number was 15,000, okay, you guys would be way, making way more money. If your TV ratings were up, you'd be making way more money. I'm not here to bash the WNBA. What I'm saying is, where is the support from women who enjoy basketball? And, and that's, I believe, why the WNBA has never reached this full potential is because women haven't embraced it. That, can, that's all I'm saying. Can I, just, can I just say something? Yes, that's all I'm saying. Okay, so to, to Amber's point, so firstly, the system is set up by men. We got started from the NBA, mm -hmm. right? I, I get that. Okay, so who, who are the owners? Who are the presidents? But, but who are the people making decisions? My sister works in TV. I get it. She tells me who the people are deciding what segment is important. You know, she advocated for me to announce, my, to announce myself on ESPN that I was signing to Seattle. But those, those, that was a woman advocating for a woman yeah. who was not in the position to make the decision without but those, her intervention. But those people who are making those, those decisions, if, if they sell out Madison Square Garden or, or the Brooklyn Nets Arena Barclays for a WNBA game, th then they can't deny you. That, that, that's what yeah. I'm trying. You can, you can. I, no, 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 no. The but, powers that be. I, I get that they might not be interested, but guess what? If the numbers are there, and I'm gonna give you the perfect example. I used wait, to watch before, the news as a kid. Let me just give you this one example. Well, I wasn't finished with my wait, thought. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> so. No, no, no. So what I was trying to say was. No, it's okay. What I was trying to say was, the people that are making the decisions are making it accessible. Correct. Mm -hmm. The NBA. Twenty-eight years into its existence was not doing the numbers that we're doing right now. Yep. Now, granted, we always like to say, hey, don't compare apples, apples to oranges. But don't you think that, one, if the system was not created by the men and you're telling little boys, oh, you can grow up and play in the NBA, and you're also telling little girls, oh, you can grow up and play in the WNBA, rather than, oh, you can grow up and have a great family. You can grow up and find a good husband. That, that, that mm. breeds the loss of interest over time. So there's things that are not quantifiable that lend to your opinion or maybe even your metrics that women are not following the WNBA. Now, I will, I will contradict you with this. Okay. Years ago, they were saying that at the age of 14, young girls were dropping out of sports seven times more likely than boys. That has flipped. Yep. That has now flipped. Today, boys are dropping out of sports faster than girls are because of the accessibility of the sport to people who may not have believed that that was even an opportunity or was even something that they could be exposed to. So that's why Amber was trying to say it's systemic and it's yeah. not just about the numbers because the numbers are gonna be low as long as it's hard to find our games. Right. Mm. If it's easy to find our games, mm. the numbers mm. will go up. So when and you so, say, okay, and so I, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna turn this into I, I want I wanna say, you know, this is obviously a, 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 a passionate conversation. Yeah. <laughs> and right, right. When, it, when it comes to thinking about um, exposure, that point of exposure, you know, what is it, in what ways has, has exposure shaped all of your lives for the industries that you're a part of, for the advocacy that you are day in, day out, um, out there hitting the pavement around? And kind of as you look into the horizon, what do you want your legacy to be as a result of the exposure that you've had across your industries? I mean, I just want to lead by listening, you know, and I want my legacy to be that of contagion. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that it's important not to shy away from conversations like this yeah. because I'm learning something from you and I hope you're learning something sure. from me. I, you know, that's I what I'm, yeah, that's what this legacy is about. It's not just about, oh, I did that, oh, we did this, oh, that happened when we were there. It's the sustainability of it. It's the, 
it's the education of it. It's us opening ourselves up to things that we don't understand or, or uh, us opening ourselves up to a perspective that we wouldn't consider otherwise. But most importantly, ensuring that those who don't always have the opportunity to represent themselves have the space to do so to create a more equitable community and world that we live in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's why I am in the media. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was a kid and wanted to be a, I grew up in New York, I wanted to be a sports columnist in a newspaper. I wanted to have my picture in the paper every day. When I was growing up, there was nobody black who had a sports column in the newspaper. So how did this kid decide that this is what he wanted to do? I wanted to have a voice. I wanted to be able to, to, to uh, be able to give a different point of view. At one point, the worst thing that ever happened in the media is that everybody was a 50-year-old white guy. So the perspective was always the same. So I thought to myself, I could bring something different, a different trail that I walked, a different experience that I had along into that. And then my legacy, I've always looked at it, mentorship and to be able to establish and build and grow as many others who have the same passion and want to be heard in this world. That's my only goal. It's not about what my career is and what I've done, but if, if I can nurture along some other people who will get to uh, learn and, and uh, have their own careers and have a voice. Yeah, I mean, I would just say in all aspects of my life, like I've always thought, my parents have always told me that you can't, and they're not the first people to see this, they're brilliant, but they're not the first people who came up with the, the phrase, you can't be what you can't see, and, or you can't think about it, right? I had, my parents are in their 70s, and they have no idea how to swim, and they put me and my sister into swim practice, and they just did it for survival, because they said, if we're, because we were living by the water, they were like, if we, something happens, we need our girls to be able to save us, right? Because my parents were terrified of the water, and they still are. And then as soon as they found out I could get a free ride to school, they were like, you're going to swim the rest of your life, <laughs> um, at least until you're 18 or no, until you're 22. Um, but I, I think that, that, you know, just that it, it's incredible to see, just to physically see. I mean, I was going to joke that, like, I didn't know that much. I knew about basketball growing up and everything, but I didn't, I knew that that WNBA existed. But I think there are a lot of people who were around my age that, also, it, a lot of things changed when we saw Love and Basketball, which sounds like ridiculous, but like seeing that movie changed so many people that are in our mid-40s, right? Mm -hmm. Of like actually seeing that, even though we knew that this existed ahead of time. Um, and I'll, I'll say also that um, there's a, a quote, um, Erica Alexander, she was cousin Pam on, depending on your age, she's cousin Pam on, uh, the, uh, on the Cosby show, but um, she, they were talking about black people and like, science fiction and whether or not black people liked science fiction or not. And you know, she was on the red carpet. And she said this quote from her husband that I love, specifically talking about black people in America. So we're talking about race and sports, and I think this is important. Um, for black people in America, um, the past is painful, depending, it doesn't matter what age you are, but the, thinking about the past of what we've gone through in this country, whether it's sports and swimming and basketball, just everything, being a woman, past is painful, the present is precarious, right? Like things happen all the time, but the future is free. Right, like we can do and we can make whatever we want. And so I was telling someone earlier that like I'm working on a project where we're we're working with students, young students from a middle school in D.C. that had four people that were shot. Middle school, four people of the students were shot last year. And so meeting with some folks actually in D.C. tomorrow, um, and we're talking about bridging the digital divide because they're working at like a digital kind of school where they're working on a lot of different things. We're going to be working on coding with them. We're also going to be teaching them swim lessons, and we're also going to be working with them on preventing gun violence. So I was like, I don't know how this is all going to figure out in my head, but I have the freedom to be able to do that. And these kids are going to turn into advocates. They already are because they advocated for themselves that they want to live in a life free from gun violence. And right now, their conditions that they're in, the material conditions that they're in are not ones that they made themselves. And so my hope through advocacy in the future is that kids can, can dream the way that I was able to and have the freedom that I did um, to be able to think about like adding the digital divide and swimming and coding and all these different things together and trying to figure out innovative ways outside the box to think about advocacy, especially whenever it comes to what we can do with sports and, and things outside the box like swimming too. With that being said, we're gonna open up. Uh, there are mics right over there, and also there are mics um, in the upper area. So if you have a question, uh, find your way to a mic and uh, we'll take them as they come in. Yes, sir. Oh, is this mic live? Yes, it is. It's live. Okay, uh, 
Some people would say that the worm may be turning with respect to women and men in basketball with the fact that the March Madness women's tournament is more exciting, attracting more attention. We watch the games and the women are hustling up and down. They're full of energy. These guys are loping along, losing by two points. So what do you have to say to that phenomenon? Maybe this is the year. And part of the problem we have here in Boston, we don't have a WNBA team. We, we got to go to Connecticut, Mohegan Sun. Now, I, I have some friends in high places. That may change, but <laughs> would you care to comment on any of that? You guys have TVs, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I'm just making sure. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think that uh, what people are experiencing right now in women's sports has always been happening. It's just people are now paying attention to it. And once something is hot, people want to put it everywhere, right? It's the accessibility, you know? So, um, you know, in times when we wouldn't be on TV, now we're on TV. Um, the exposure also from athletes is changing things. I, I, you know, we saw what happened when they were showing what the inside of the, you know, the tournament looked like a couple years ago. Yeah. And that brought what was obviously a problem to the public, where there was a, a level of accountability that had to, that had to change, you know? And, and now it's no longer, you know, women's Final Four. Now it's March Madness, March Madness, you know? And I think it's just kind of a matter of time. I'm excited about it. Um, but I think also, too, when it comes to, you know, supporting and um, finding ways to, to stay connected, even though there's not a WNBA team here, you got Harvard women's basketball, you know, yeah. like <laughs> you have, there's women's teams everywhere. Pandering to the crowd. No. <laughs> <laughs> there's women's teams everywhere. And um, finding a way to remain connected, I think, is just really important. And I, and I think it's also important to note that, you know, in what we experienced here, like us having a very healthy conversation around like our different understandings, that's a perfect example of where, like, I try to say feminism, feminism is not exclusive. Right. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, it, it takes advocates that are men mm -hmm. to also show why I, this needs to be happening. I agree. And so, and so I, I, just, um, I just want people to understand that we have different perspectives, we have different understandings, um, but your experience a lot of times supersedes another's in this in this and I mean that by like in this society if you think about yourself there's usually almost always someone else who's lower on the totem pole and that's something that I always kind of consider it's something that really came to my mind in 2020 because I had a family member that was like but you're Nigerian they're not going to know you know they're, you're Nigerian you're not black and I was like if I'm walking up the street <laughs> they're just gonna see a I? black girl you yeah. know and so you know whether it's white men men, white women, black women, Latinx, LGBTQ, you just have to consider that when you, when you think about the whole, something as simple as watching women's sports, you might be having a game on and you might expose it to a young boy mm -hmm. who likes basketball, who just likes basketball. Right. And so that's what I love, that's what I love to see about the rise of women's sports. It's not the acknowledgement of one's beauty is, does not equate to the absence of your own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm experiencing with women's basketball right now. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. thank, thank you very much. And just uh, a shout out to Harvard's women basketball. The women were in the Ivy League tournament and the men stayed home. So thank you. <laughs> I would also just add, add to that that I, I think it's, it's important that we always continue to think about the role of race in the rise of these sports too and what that can do that's really great. Um, we work in Texas on things like the Crown Act and it's really important, um, and it, but it also needs to be enforced. And so as we're thinking about having more women that have exposure about who we're uplifting and who we're platforming because everyone deserves to get platformed, but 
you know, we're, we're trying to promote equity, which is different than equality. Like, I don't want to be a white man, right? I want, to, I want the same things that a white man has, that a, like a rich white man has. And so I would like to be equitable in that mm -hmm. sense, I don't want to be the exact same as him. I want people to see me as a black woman living in society. Um, and so um, I think that it's really important that we celebrate women, all different types of women that are gonna be, you know, some people will be really palpable to the news and people will really love them and some people won't. But I, I think especially as like, I spend a couple hours a night on TikTok, I'm not supposed to, but I am on TikTok every night and you just see that I go straight to the comments and I'm like, okay, well I need to like comment here because they don't like that black woman or they don't like this person's hair or something like that. That's not healthy. So I'm not telling you guys to do that. <laughs> but I am saying that you, you see it and especially because things go viral so much right now that I want us to also be careful and aware of what can happen um, if we aren't careful about what equity looks like in terms of race and sports, especially mm -hmm. whenever it comes to women, yeah. but also just men as well as, as, you know, the Olympics are coming up, so many different things. And so um, it, it's a, almost a double-edged sword sometimes mm -hmm. too. There's a question over here. Hi, my name's Tenzin and I'm a sophomore at Harvard College. First of all, thank you so much for being here. This is an incredible panel. I'm so glad we're getting to hear about, uh, about sports and the intersection of sports and policy. My question is about another aspect of public health and its intersection with sports, particularly CTE and football. Um, and I'm wondering what, you all, what, what perspectives you all bring to the debate over allowing children to play football, and especially in, in the light of recent studies about how many children have, have died um, from just playing as children and then even stopping after, um, after, after their childhood careers um, have passed away in recent years, whether or not we should even allow football programs in elementary schools, middle schools around the country, and how you think we can um, incorporate education to families that hold sports at such a high level um, and who see it as access to money, an opportunity for their children to go to college and to have access to careers in the NFL. I have a coworker on Fox Sports Radio, Ephraim Salam. He played 14 years in the NFL and uh, has two sons. He, he will not allow them to play football, even though he made a living for his family playing football because he said, I know how I feel every day and I don't want my children to go through that. So there's a, there's a big debate and there are people on the other side who say, look at me, I'm good and I played 14 years in the league and I'm okay. But you, the numbers have gone down for kids playing football mm -hmm. where parents have just stepped in and said that this isn't what they want. Um, it's, 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 not going, uh, it's, it's going to be interesting as, as we go forward. I do believe, though, as the country becomes more brown, uh, that soccer and baseball will eventually, I know nobody wants to believe it, but I think soccer and baseball will be the bigger sports going forward. I do believe that. Well, even in, even in soccer right now, they're suggesting that headbutting the ball. Yeah. Um, the and, headers, right. And exactly. They give you a concussion. The implication. And then there are conversations on can technology offset some of the, those harms. And it's definitely an area ripe for uh, debate and, and perspective shifting. Um, and there are a lot of different perspectives when it comes to uh, the willingness to kind of allow um, this next generation to participate, and it's it's a hot topic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Up there. Thank you. Oh, you're Thank you. Hi, thanks so much for this panel. Uh, my name is Jack. I'm an undergrad at the college. Uh, I'm wondering, all of you kind of hit on athletes' collective bargaining power, um, whether it's fighting for equal pay or fighting for political representation. You know, we talked about male and female athletes that kind of use their role to push for something that they cared about. I'm wondering if you have any advice for athletes in leagues or sports that haven't had that you know, mobilization so far. Um, like you mentioned, for example, the NFL, where the collective bargaining isn't as strong. Why do you think that is, and what advice do you have to get past barriers to collective mobilization? Uh, no, you can go ahead. No, I'm going to just say, uh, until they stop the games, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Until they go to the Super Bowl and tell the commissioner when everything's set up that they're not playing that day, we saw it in baseball. They stopped the World Series in 1994. Guess who just signed, because they didn't like the way the owners were doing financially collusion and not paying them. Guess who signed a $700 million contract this past 
offseason. Shohei Otani with the Dodgers. They, they damaged the sport for a little bit by doing the stoppage, but they did get what they want. Same thing. The NIL, you talked about it in the college and the Wild Wild West. Until college players are collectively bargained for as a group, not as individuals, they will always be taken advantage of. What's been done to most college athletes, and this is why you see the Nick Sabins and all the old guard coaches starting to retire, because they don't have complete control over the kids anymore. Mm -hmm. And they don't like the system because, they, because the kids can walk out on them like they've walked out on the kids. All the stuff that they, they've done, they've made millions. There used to be a time when kids, if they took a pizza from a free pizza, they got kicked out of school or off the team. I mean, this is like, like mind-boggling, but this is the stuff that went on. And now, I, until they have a collective bargaining where, I, I can't remember the school that, that wanted to unionize just recently. Mm. I think they, yeah. Dartmouth. Dartmouth, yeah. Okay, this is what needs to happen because you can't do it as individuals. You got to do it collectively. And then you can work through the NIL and make some sort of system. But you can't allow the college coaches and the universities to work in your best, they're not going to work in your best interest. People got to remember, even the NIL money is not coming from the university. They're not paying the kids. They've refused to give the kids a dime. The NCAA March Madness. Six billion dollar TV contract. Players get nothing from that. Mm -hmm. Those are real. How? I, I would also say I'm happy to also share with any. In law school, I did my kind of it's like kind of like a thesis, but my final paper on the arbitration process in the NFL and how it is inherently systemically unfair to the players because it's the system, right? It's it's the collect collective bargaining. But if their system of like how you like say you blow up the entire thing, you still have this like contract arbitration or process that you have to go to, and is that the right process? I'm happy to share with anybody, um, but it's um, there's also some systemic pro major systemic problems okay. with um, what what you agreed to um, and how that has to play out. So regardless of what, if everybody walks off or not, um, there's still some th some things that are set in place that are just inherently unfair to most of the players too. And just to top it off, in 2020, we were able to successfully negotiate a collective bargaining agreement after having basically what was the, the same CBA for a couple decades. And I, you know, albeit we do have a smaller cohort, we did it by first just like educating ourselves, you know? I think that there's a lot of weight when it comes to collective bargaining and really, to you're entering a league where you're just trying to figure out what team you're playing on mm -hmm. and there's so many responsibilities as a professional athlete. And so when we were met with that, with the opt-out option um, in 2018, uh, I just told our executive director, I was like, I just want people to be educated. I just, can you just give us a cliff notes of what the current CBA looks like? And the only ask that I had of the players was, we need to be engaged. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't care what you vote. I just want the voting turnout to be good. And that led to us being able to successfully negotiate a CBA where we had over, I believe it was 98% of the players that voted. We're not even talking about the result because as we know in this country, when there's less votes, the, it's not, it doesn't represent the grand scheme of things. It doesn't represent the overall population. And so um, we did our best to read our CBA, see what we wanted to change. And then through that, you have negotiations, which is quite daunting, but to both of their points, athletes really do have the power. Um, but it's harder alone than it is together. And you just have to make sure that everyone is on the same page. It doesn't necessarily mean everyone has to agree, because once you start off hoping that everyone agrees, that's when things become a little bit more complicated. You just have to make sure that there's a platform for people to express their needs, their wants, what's going well, what's not going well. Assess, the, assess what you have in front of you, and then figure out what you can do moving forward. I always say that in CBAs, everyone's not gonna get everything that they want, but everyone will get something, something. that they want. Right. And that goes for the league side as well when it comes to the professional athletes. So I think that um, just keeping those like simple things in mind can be very important. But I see, I see these universities that are, that are unionizing. And I, I really do think that the strength would be is if you know, we had a, a union coalition of professional sports that could advocate on behalf of, of the university, of yeah. the college players.
So I'm mindful that we're at time, but I also see we have two folks at the mic. If you might be able to both pose your questions and then we'll wrap after hearing both of your questions. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, thank you guys for coming, I appreciate it. Um, my name is Kay Talbert, one of the track and field coaches here at Harvard. Um, your passion, your intensity, your intellect about this really shines through. Um, two things. One is I have a young daughter, she's four and a half, so we try to put her in swimming and ice skating, expose her to, to things that you might not otherwise see young black girls in, so I appreciate your point and your perspective. Um, my question is actually about baseball. Um, growing up, I um, watched Reggie Jackson, Willie Randolph, Dave Winfield, Rod Carew, and so on and so forth, the senior Ken Griffey, and I could never have imagined that I couldn't name 10 black players in the league. You know, is there any real interest on the league's part um, to reverse that trend to get it back to where there's a robust group of black players playing Major League Baseball again. Well, two and, up, gonna and we're going to grab one more okay. question. Yeah, um, my name's Koma. I'm a graduate student here, and I wanted to ask about changing the power infrastructure going off of um, the previous question about having more um, head coaches. Like, we see rules like the Rooney Rule in the NFL where it seems pretty performative, and there aren't um, actual candidates that are chosen that are minorities or are black. So I was wondering how you change that power infrastructure to actually have um, owners that are, have played the sport and or understand the sport and aren't just um, from backgrounds that aren't really applicable. Yeah. Oh, the, the baseball, so they, they uh, about 20 some odd years ago, uh, baseball basically outsourced the jobs to Latin America and it was just Economics, again, we talk about financial. They were tired of paying people bonuses, so they set up academies in Latin America. Baseball will pay you once you become a star. What they didn't want to do is pay young kids in the minor leagues who they hope to make it to the majors a $10 million bonus, and then the kid doesn't pan out. So what they did was they did that, and that's where you, know, you, you have a, a huge influx. And you gotta remember too, there are plenty of young black players now currently in the minor leagues on their way up. That's good news. Uh, when you talk about naming 10 black players, Shohei Otani might be on everybody's mind, obviously, $700 million, two-way pitcher and a hitter. But Mookie Betts and Aaron Judge are black players who are as big as anybody else in the game currently. Not as many. I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. But I do see the tide has turned and that we, we are getting more and more black players playing baseball. And at one time, I think the Michael Jordan effect had a, had a big impact on it. Everybody wanted to be like Mike. And you gotta remember, baseball, you gotta go to the minor leagues for a couple of years. They wanna go to college for one year or high school, get right into making big money and being a pro and not put in that other work that it takes to be a baseball player. It's a lot more, it's a lot more work. But the other yeah, and then to your question, I mean, as a player, sometimes it seems a little bit daunting to feel as though like I can have any type of influence in that. Um, but, you know, as Amber and I were talking, you know, things are systemic, you know, and I think that because of how, for example, our league was birthed, um, a majority of the change makers or the decision makers are white and male. Um, and it comes, it, it comes with, um, with, with great progress of a league, you know, the success of a league, um, I, th I think in our WNBA, it exposes to a diversity of representation. And I think as long as the players speak up about it, as long as um, there are people in positions who can make those decisions, those things will change. Um, but that's really what will cause the biggest shift, uh, especially for women in sports and for women of color in sports. And for me personally, I do think it starts with women being in sport. Um, because when women are in sport, you know, the only option shouldn't be that you should play, you know? It could be that you're someone like Amber, who is really making some serious change. But I, I, I'm, I could maybe speak and say that a lot of what you learned as an athlete, you still apply to what you do sure. today. Yeah. And they said that I think it's over about, is it, it's, it's oh, definitely over 50% of women um, who were athletes or who, were in, who are in C-suite positions were athletes. Mm -hmm. 
and they have that perspective of a team and competition. Um, but I do think it definitely starts with the availability, the accessibility, being and seeing so that young women can know that there's different ways to be involved in sport and thus change the representation of those who are making the decisions for the people that um, are an overwhelming representation of the minorities of our communities. So to Neca, to Rob, to Amber, to the Institute of Politics, to IARA, thank you. 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 Thank you.